Welcome to the podcast series, Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafta, and today I'll be chatting with Akshay Grover, Group CEO of Salient. Akshay, how are you doing? Great, Stacey. Uh, fantastic in the, in the new year now that I'm back from a two-week break, which was quite welcome. Nice. I had almost a month vacation because I had so much leave that we had to just use. But it's the longest break I've taken in years and it felt amazing. Did you do anything fun on yours? Uh, Well, actually, I was, you know, thanks to Omicron and some flight disruption, (laughs) uh, uh, I had to cancel my holiday plans and instead stuck around in Nairobi, um, though Mm. we managed to get away to to the Mara for a bit. Awesome. 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 Well, actually, I'm really excited to learn more about your career journey and essentially what led you to become group CEO of Salient. Floor's yours. Uh, you know, Stacey, I think, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the way to, to answer that question is to kind of just walk you through, um, how this all came about. And, you know, I think, I think the starting point of my Africa journey was really, yeah. was, Perhaps my stint at EY back in 2007 when I put set foot on on the continent, mm-hmm. and at that time uh, 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 I managed to get to Cameroon. Uh, it wasn't the most hospitable experience uh, that I can recall. Um, really? Uh, but we were representing an Indian business to buy an asset. Uh, I was an investment banker those days with Anthony Young, and we. We were buying an asset in Cameroon. Um, uh, at those, at that point of time, Cameroon didn't even have probably, you know, a, a rooftop on its airport terminal. So it was sort of a wow. tin roof. You, walk into, <laughs> you know, literally a tin roof airport. And I was, you know, wow. my impression of Africa started there. But, but I think over time, uh, I went on to do more stuff in Africa and then uh, at one, one of the, on one of the occasions in 2012, um, uh, met, uh, a first generation entrepreneur, an Indian guy who, who wanted to set up or who had the, had a vision to set up the largest, uh, business process outsourcing and IT business in Africa. Mm. And at that time, that was quote unquote a little sexier than it is today. Um, yeah. because, uh, a lot of outsourcing was happening in the world. And of course, India was at the center of that. Mm. Uh, and these guys said that I want to raise, you know, $30 million to do this business. I don't have a company. Uh, I don't have a business yet, but I have a vision and a plan. Um, and then somehow I got in, engaged on that, um, on that process. And, um, even though it was impossible, we actually managed to raise that quantum of capital pretty much in a very smallish company back in 2013. And, and again, that was a time when, you know, tech investments in Africa are nowhere, uh, were nowhere around the corner. Uh, very, very early days for technology in Africa back in 2013. Um, and then they had, um, a largest African fund called Satya Capital that invested in that business. Um, and after that, somehow destiny brought us together. And one of the days, the founders of this business met me again at an airport in Bahrain and said, you know, how long do you want to keep doing investment banking? Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking to myself, yeah, I mean, I've done 10 years of this. Um, seems like I could do something different. And he said, why don't yeah. you, why don't you work with me and help me build this? outsourcing slash IT business in Africa. And so in 2014, I joined this group called ISON uh, to help them build their business. And then the next six years sort of just flew by flying across every single country there is in Africa, meeting, setting up the business, growing that business from 100 people to almost 30,000 by the time wow. I left ISON in, in December of 2020. Um, by then we'd raised $500 million of equity capital in that business. Lots of private equity had come in, some had gone out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for me, uh, that combination of having 
um, been in an organization like EY that was yeah. very process driven, uh, system process governance to be yeah yeah then, then in thrown that you know in deep into the entrepreneurial environment was quite a shocker uh, but taught me a lot gave me a lot of life lessons um, more importantly figured out how to do business in almost every country in Africa and wow. I think it set the foundation for me then to to join Celluland because um, because the combination of both, let's call it structured and unstructured came together. Um, and I think, um, that's sort of a good summary of how I got to be at Celluland in the first place. That's awesome. The last time we spoke, you were interim CEO and now you're officially the group CEO. How has things changed and how has the position changed since? Mm, yeah, well, my day job is still the same, Stacey. That's the okay. <laughs> Uh, so but, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> not much has changed. Uh, but, you know, I think, I, I think, um, I think the board, when I was hired in the business, uh, the, the shareholders in the board had a view that they wanted to bring in somebody who would be a strong partner to the founders and be mm-hmm. ready to, uh, to take on the shoes of the founders that had initially set up this business. Of course. Um, and, and, you know, there was, there's always a journey to sort of getting there, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and I think being, being interim CEO probably was a good bridge during that journey. Um, so that's what I would say. But I think, um, I think it, le- I think having, um, any leadership which is permanent mm. is, is always good for a business yeah. because it creates certainty. Um, and it creates an environment where, uh, people are not wondering what's happening at leadership. So I think that's the biggest sure. value, uh, yeah. that that brings, um, other than, you know, any other aspect of the business. Yeah. Salient has made it their purpose to create opportunities that accelerate economic growth for all of Africa. Your experience crosses many borders and at times many outside of Africa. How have you found, your past positions prepared you for something like this and for a mission like this? I think having a worldview is always helpful. Yeah. Um, fintech is, is a very fast growing sector. It's a sector where things are evolving very, very rapidly. So having an understanding of what's happening in uh, some, let's call it front leading emerging markets like yeah. India, China, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Singapore. Uh, I think, I think it, it only adds to your understanding of how some of those markets mm. have evolved over time. Uh, there are always things to learn and contextualize, um, in terms of saying what is then applicable to Africa. I think that applicability is something that, that you can only learn experientially. Uh, the second thing I think having a lot of global experience is it helps you to navigate people, culture, understand nuances so that you're a lot more sensitive to the way people are, the way people work, what people mm-hmm. like, what people don't like. And that's, I can't stress on how important that is. Uh, when you're working in a business that operates in 30 plus countries, because it's more important for you to be adaptable than it is for those people to be adaptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at EY, you started out as a senior consultant and over the course of around like 10 years, you became a director. It's so rare these days to find somebody staying loyal to a company for that long. What do you think kept you there? And, and what's your opinion on the youth job hopping so often? That's a great question because, you know, I come across so many people nowadays who, who literally are hopping jobs every, every, every year or every one, eight years. Crazy, months. yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I think it's unfair to, to compare, uh, how life could have been 15 years back to where it is now. Uh, so it's probably not fair, but, you know, my take on all of this is that firstly, for you to meaningfully, at least in the early part of your career, I think it's very important 
to be focused on learning than it is to be focused on how much money you make and okay. if you're focused on learning you are building long term value mm. um and you will get an opportunity to monetize that that capability that mm. learning that you've gathered over the over the over the life but you need to have the patience to achieve that now whether it should be 10 years or it should be 5 years is always a question that we can calibrate uh, in today's environment just given the dynamism of what's happening around us but but i think my view is to some extent i would say that i've always been a fan of saying little at least a medium at least have a medium term outlook to okay. to how you're doing and if you're getting the learning if you're if you have the career growth if you have the opportunities where you're sitting then you know there's always something or the other in the world which looks nicer um but you know when you land up there you realize that you just traded off one set of downsides for another set of downsides so was it really worth it yeah i'm sure you look at quite a lot of cvs when you're interviewing and it's probably more at a senior level so job hopping maybe may not be as common but is there a sweet spot like what's that number you look at what number will you be like nope i'm not going to consider that's too short that you've stayed at these last two companies at x amount of time and where do you think that sweet spot lies uh, hard question stacy but uh, <laughs> there's no there's no there's no there's no right or wrong answer on this one and i think it, it's a judgment because yeah. you know you come across people who spend uh 10 years in an organization and then did mm. three one year stints you know yeah and now what do you make of that is it that the person uh suddenly changed his dynamic or is yeah. it that you know he just didn't find his sweet spot you know and that, that yeah. happens a lot right so i think it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a judgment call on sure on on how you look at any piece of information Definitely. but i think that if from start to end somebody is changing a job every two years Mm. Like, I I feel that at least for me somebody for me looking at that resume I feel like mm, you know is there really a value in hiring this and you know is this person just constantly looking for the next best thing right yeah um and is that then valuable for me to invest in that individual as an organization right sure uh, so I, I so I so I I'd stay away from saying there's a hard answer but I, hopefully I've answered your question Yeah, the importance is the why. I think that's also something that you're touching on. It's like why did they jump? Like who knows, maybe that business was shutting down or um maybe that just wasn't the right culture fit for them. They're not just somebody who goes in and gives up. You just never know what the actual story is. So no, I definitely agree with that. Um I did want to say congratulations. You're near closing a funding round. So this will be what Celine's fourth round of funding is that correct? Yeah, it's a series D. Uh I I wouldn't say we're close, but I would say we're definitely midway through there. Uh um, awesome. and I think um hopefully hopefully if all goes well we should close it maybe by April or May. Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh created a new hypothetical game. And that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what would you make? Something original and exciting? A Dark Souls city builder, a co-op roguelike? Everything, all of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a uh, and put it in a first-person shooter. And we could have a loot system with uh, survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could Oh, I don't know, it's save a kingdom from some out of control toasters. You know, uh what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favorite podcast platforms. That's huge. How has this round differed from the rest? It's a big household name now, so I'm sure it's been a different experience. I I think that I think I think, you know, as you progress to your maturity, um there is there is greater amount of clarity on the direction that the business is taking because you're not testing too much you you you're testing you're you're figuring out where you want to go a, a lot of the direction is already set unlike when you're in your series a when you're still defining direction yeah yeah so i think i think direction setting is clear i think by the time you get to a series d you've also built 
um, quite a bit of management depth and capability. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, though, though candidly, that's something you probably do forever, right? As you raise more capital, the business is growing leaps and bounds and you always want to add more, more and more depth on that front. Mm-hmm. But, you know, at least there is some baseline which is in there, uh, at the moment. And then the third thing is, um, because you've spread out as a business across 35 countries, you have customers, large customers that you service, not in one country, but in 15, 20, 25 countries. So I think, I think you begin, as you said, to be known as more of, I wouldn't say a household name because we aren't a consumer business, but at yeah. least, uh, at least well known in, in your business community, in your partners, in your banking system, uh, amongst your customers and so on and so forth. So I think all those three or four things have changed between series A and series B. Yeah. And to that extent, it does make the process of capital raising um, a lot easier than in the very, very early days. Do you have any advice for those going through capital raising currently? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, again, you know, I think that advice is nuanced based on when you're raising capital, how you're raising yeah. capital and so on. Yeah. But, but I've had one philosophy because uh, partly because you see what's happening around you and partly because I'm also an, an angel investor myself and, and I keep investing capital, awesome. my own capital in early stage businesses. And I, and I see a lot of founders making a mistake, which is chasing valuation and chasing fundraise as an end game. Whereas okay. the end game is actually building a great business. Yeah. Um, because if you achieve building a great business, capital, there is no dearth of capital in this world. Capital will follow you. What you have to be focused on at every stage in the business is doing something which is disruptive, doing something which creates value. It actually addresses a pain point somewhere. And then of course, there is an ability to scale that idea and that concept, right? So I think, I, I think if, if you focus on the business, there's a very strong probability that you will be successful in raising capital. It just might take you a few more weeks, a few more months, but that's just the pain you have to go through with every fundraise. I find angel investors so interesting. And I know that you have a lot of experience in investment in your prior career, but do you, what do you look for? Early stage businesses, obviously there, there are certain things you look for. What draws you to businesses where you look at that? You're like, yes, this is the type of business I want to put my money in. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to Stacy. I think it always goes back to a couple of fundamentals. Uh, question number one, as I said, is a problem being solved? Mm. Question number two, how big is that problem that you're solving in terms of addressable size, market opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Third is, does the, is the, the founder slash the team, do they have uh, the right experience, the right capabilities, passion, mm. integrity? Uh, so is it in short, is it the right team? Yeah. Um, um, those two, three questions are my most, let's call it stressed upon questions when I'm thinking yeah. about, should I invest or should I not invest? Um, um, there is maybe a fourth, which is how good is the execution capability of yeah. that team? Yeah. But you know, that's always a question that you almost always cannot answer before making the investment <laughs> because, yeah. because, because, because you're making an investment at such an early stage that yeah. there isn't enough of an execution track record for you to really understand whether this team can execute or not. So you are almost always using judgment on that one than using any hard data. I speak to fintech startups every single day. Some of them one person, some of them five, some of them 20, some of them 100. And this is something that I'm so fascinated about. And I would love to start. Where would somebody like myself for their first investment? Where do you begin? Where do you look? Um, do you have any advice for somebody like myself who hasn't even begun? Stacy, there, 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 there can't be a right answer to that question. Because sure. honestly, I think, I, I think the only thing I would advise you is, you know, if you have $100 to invest, invest $10 
in 10 opportunities. Mm. Don't invest $50 in one and $50 in the second. Because mm. the probability you're going to go wrong is very, very high. Yeah. So I think any early stage first time investors, my advice is invest small amounts. It's okay to lose some money. Yeah. Be yeah. ready to lose some money. Be prepared to write off amounts. But if you are disciplined and if you are consistent and you allocate that capital to 10 opportunities, right? There is a reasonably high chance that you will succeed on the $100 to make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. No, that's great advice. Thanks so much. Akshay, April is around the corner. Do you have any big plans that you're allowed to share for the round being closed? Not really, Stacey. I mean, that's not <laughs> something I can okay, comment okay. on. Sure, uh, sure, sure. Unfortunately. Uh, but but what I can say is what what are the one or two or three big items that we are already doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and one of them is very close to where you are. Uh, was that we just recently set up our South Africa business, literally two weeks back, four weeks back. That's awesome. That's awesome. And we, that's a market that we want to actively address. Uh, and the second such market is in the opposite direction. It's in Egypt, in North Africa. Uh, both these offices slash countries have been opened up so far, we've predominantly been in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, mm-hmm. So in a way, it's our first meaningful foray outside of sub-Sahara into both North and South Africa. So that's yeah. one uh, material development direction that we're taking in the coming weeks. That is so exciting. I'm excited to see. I'm definitely going to keep up with everything. Salient has the potential to become a unicorn year in Africa. What do you think are a couple things that are needed to accomplish this? This is going to be huge. I'm hoping, Stacey, we we get to unicorn well before the end of this calendar year. Um, And I think I think I think we are we are already on a good path to get there. Um, uh, But again, uh, going back to the same advice, you know, I, 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 which is, you know, being unicorn is not an end by itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, having a $1 billion is not an end by itself. I think building a great sustainable business, which addresses mm-hmm. the needs of the market is what we are trying to build here. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's what we want to keep ourselves razor focused on. If it's 1 billion, it's 1 billion. If it's 3 billion, it's 3 billion. If it's 700 million, it's 700 million. Yeah. Uh, but we believe with that approach, we will create significant value for our shareholders. Akshay, thank you so much for your time. This podcast episode was definitely insightful. Akshay, where's the best place for listeners to reach you? LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, Connecting the Global Fintech Community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new, exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.